What do you think the pro-democracy forces in this country need to be doing now that we're not doing well enough? Well, I think you had it right when you were talking about the obligation to persuade. You can't content moderate your way out of this problem in social media, right? You can't say, like, the problem is the person who created this meme. People ought to know that the anti-Semitic stuff that's circulating right now around pro-Trump social media presence is not, like, edgy, modern, um, you know, anti-woke right. uh, bravery. It's old news. I'm John Favreau. Welcome to Offline. My guest today is Rachel Maddow, longtime anchor at MSNBC. A couple months ago, Rachel stepped down from her daily show to give herself some time, in the spirit of offline, to unplug. But Rachel is a political junkie just like me, so instead she threw herself into researching and telling the story of a little known but incredibly important moment in American history, one that ultimately evolved into her new podcast, Ultra, which is the topic of our show today. Ultra is the story of a right-wing plot to violently overthrow the U.S. government that was aided and abetted by members of Congress, not in January of 2021, but in January of 1940. According to Rachel, our unprecedented political moment isn't unprecedented at all. She argues that America has flirted with fascism before and came much closer to ending democracy than we did last year. So we talked about the threats of the past and today, how social media and the internet has changed the nature of those threats, and why it's so damn hard to hold together a liberal democracy of more than 300 million people. Rachel Maddow, welcome to Offline. Hi, John. How are you? I'm well. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm really happy that you do this this particular podcast. I think this is a oh, sign thanks. of maturity and investment in self-preservation <laughs> and like intellectual health. And I'm really glad that you do it. This is uh, this is a this is a cool framing. I love that you're doing this. Yeah, I I, I started it for my own mental health as much as everyone else's. So it's been a, <laughs> there's a selfish reason as well. Um, <laughs> I loved your podcast, Bagman. Hmm. I am even more obsessed with Ultra. Like, I I was hooked in the first five minutes, even though it involves a plane crash and I hate flying. Mm -hmm. Sorry. (laughs) I was still about to fly after this, but I still I was was listening yesterday. Um, So I want to sum it up without spoiling it for people. You are telling a little known, little remembered story about a fascist plot to overthrow the U.S. government in the early 1940s, seeded by Hitler's Germany, uh, that almost succeeded. How did you discover this story? And like, why do you think it hasn't really been told yet? I think I'll ask the, answer the second question first. I think that the reason it hasn't been told yet ish is kind of the same problem as Bagman, which is that there is a thing that happens in history where if you happen to land in the timeline close to a bigger thing, We can only remember one thing from that part of the timeline. And so Agnew getting forced out as vice president and the bizarre and interesting and complex role of the Justice Department in figuring out how to deal with this like rank gangster criminal in the White House. um, That story is fascinating, but it happened immediately adjacent to Watergate. And Watergate is more important because it ousted the president. And so therefore we have to unlearn Watergate, basically, in order to learn Agnew. It's sort of the same thing with this, I think, um, in that these seditious plots and the Hitler government trying to build not just a fifth column here, but trying to support Americans who really did want a Hitler-style fascist dictatorship here. It was big news. It was front page news. It was, you know, everybody in the country talking about it. And then Pearl Harbor happened. And then we just went to war with the Nazis. So what they were trying to do here to soften us up for a fascist takeover, um, ended up being subsumed into the larger plot of us beating the snot out of them on the battlefield. And so that's understandable. Like World War II is more important, but there is this other thing adjacent to it, sort of overshadowed by it in the number line. And that means that the story hasn't widely been told. Interestingly, the where the story goes, where the Um, podcast goes is to a specific sedition trial in 1944, whereupon obviously World War II is well underway. And there is a little bit of an sort of academic and political live history of that, but only on the right, Hmm. because the right has told that history basically from the perspective of sympathizing with the defendants and saying, oh, the Justice Department is always just out to get conservatives and this was a political witch hunt. Uh. And I'm happy for them to tell that story, but there are there's a broader history to tell about it, too. And so that's what I'm that's what I'm trying to do. And how did you stumble upon this? 
John, I live in a dark place. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, same, same. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, six or seven years ago started reading a lot and thinking a lot about democratic countries confronting a shift to authoritarian forms of government and fascist movements and how you deal with pol- politics moving from, I would say, extremism to something beyond that, to kind of ultra politics, where you're mm. not no longer talking about th- solving things through political means and you're talking about using violence. I start, I've been sort of marinating in that, both in terms of what I'm reading for fiction and also what I've been thinking about in terms of history for the last six or seven years. And I actually wanted to write something or at least study something about really um, rank extremism on the right adjacent to Republican electoral politics, kind of leading up to Reagan. Um, David Korn's new book actually has some good stuff on this in terms of like the stuff that you think is way too extreme to ever be touched by modern electoral politics. And through the 70s and 80s, you end up getting it, abutting Republican politics. I was sort of interested in that. And then I got into, from that, um, the origins of American Holocaust denial. And then I got from that into actually... Nazi um, acolytes in the United States. And then when I realized what was going on with this sort of revisionist history of the sedition trial from 1944, I realized, oh, crap, I, I have found myself in the middle of something I cannot extricate myself from without doing six months of work on it. Cheery, cheery stuff. I mean, yeah, I'm a, a great a, girlfriend. A very, <laughs> a very intentional and, and terrifying theme of the show is the is the many parallels between what happened in the early 40s and what's happening today. Um, and that includes and, and really starts with a powerful ultra right propaganda apparatus with tremendous reach. Can you tell us a little bit about Father Charlie Coughlin and his radio show? So Coughlin is, I feel like Coughlin is the one figure from this whole podcast, from this whole story that I'm telling that you might have heard of. Yeah. I feel like people talk about Father Coughlin. Um, he sometimes, it, I thought it was Father Coughlin, but it's Coughlin. Me too, um, until I heard yeah. the podcast. Yeah, Yeah. me too, until I started listening to the contemporaneous stuff. I was like, oh. Um, but he's, he has more media reach than anybody we can analogize him to in modern politics. And I feel like the reason that his name is still alive is that people do generally think, oh, we've had right wing populist demagogues in conservative media before it's been dangerous, before you have this kind of vague sense about it. I don't think that he's analogous to anything today. He had 30 million to 40 million people listening to him every week at a time when there were less than 130 million people in the country. Like, that is just huge reach. Yeah, that is that's, like unheard of. And we think of, when we think about like maximum reach and like universalist media experiences, we think about the big three networks. Like, no, he completely swamped them in terms of what was going on. And there's never been anybody that dominant since. And he was really, really, really radical. He didn't start off as a radical. He kind of started off as a New Deal FDR supporter, but then turned very explicitly to fascism. And, you know, he printed the Protocols of the Elders of Zion and he called for his followers to take up arms and become militia groups and effectively to overthrow the government, which they tried to do. And so we've got our share of right wing media driven political extremism. But Coughlin... There's nothing like that. And actually, for me, that's kind of a helpful yeah. benchmark because it's. I think it's worth being real about what we have faced in the past and how dangerous it was in the past and what you know previous good-hearted, civic-minded Americans saved us from. And the threat that Coughlin posed was way worse than what we have faced in our demagogic <laughs> times. And that should, be, I think, to me at least, that's heartening. Like, oh, yeah. we've gone up against worse than this. Well, and it was so overt, right? I mean, that's the th- it, there was no. I mean, we're we're sort of past dog whistles now <laughs> in our in our extreme politics. Yeah, yeah. But um, when you have Father Coughlin just being like just openly anti-Semitic, asking people to take up arms, and of course he facilitates the creation of the Christian Front, which is essentially a, pa- a fascist paramilitary organization that nearly executed a plot to overthrow the government. Can you talk a little bit about the plot and how close it was to succeeding? The thing that was scary about the Christian Front plot and I mean, the broader story, the thing that's scary about the Christian Front plot is it's it's only one of like four or five that we can tell in the course of just focusing on 1940. There was a lot of this kind of stuff going on. But with the Christian Front 
one of the things that was scary about it was its um, the combination of its extremism, its violent extremism, and how popular it was. I mean, yeah. it grew out of this massive media figure of Charles Coughlin and his 30 to 40 million supporters. When they when the Christian Front Unit in New York went on trial for sedition, 2,000 people in Brooklyn showed up to cheer them when they were acquitted and otherwise got off with a mistrial. I mean, it was really well supported. It wasn't some, you know, neo-Nazi fringe group standing on an overpass in Florida, right? This was a group that had a lot of community support. And so that's unnerving. Um, But then also just what they were capable of. Most of the people who were arrested in the Christian Front sedition trial uh, and put on trial were either in the National Guard or had active military connections. They had um, heavy machine guns that they had stolen from the U.S. military. They had explosive, U.S. military explosives, One of the stories that we actually don't tell in the podcast, but is true, is that this machine gun unit National Guard commander who gave the Christian front guys all this cordite, all this military grade ordinance, also then advised them on how better to make their pipe bombs, how how, how to better make their bombs to make them more effective. So they're making and stockpiling military grade ordinance in bombs that are designed to blow up like a Jewish newspaper and uh, the Federal Reserve Bank outposts and all these different things. They had a plan to kill Um, 12 congressmen simultaneously, and they were hoping that by attacking uh, institutions of the government and Jewish and left-wing targets, they would inspire kind of an Antifa violent response that Uh. they would get anti-fascist, communist, Jewish, whatever whatever they fantasized would rise up against them. They believed that the National Guard, which was already on their side, in some ways, um, would side with them. The National Guard would be activated. They would bring the Christian front with them, and there would be a military junta that took over on the eastern seaboard and then established emergency powers over the U.S. government. And so it was to get rid of democracy, to have a military-based, law enforcement-based violent overthrow. And they had a date for it. They had the weapons for it. They were well-trained. And the FBI believed they were within a week of starting to set off the bombs um, when they picked them all up. And it's then they just, were acquitted. They were acquitted. I was gonna, yeah. <laughs> well, it's also just, it's it's just incredible that we got that close because I feel like the history you learn in school, or at least the history I learned, even when you're like at advanced levels of history, is like, well, uh, there was World War II and the United States was resistant. Like people didn't really want to go to war because we had just been through World War One, And so there was a lot of people in the country who didn't think we should before Pearl Harbor. And maybe there were some sympathizers here and there uh, in the United States. But this was like a full fledged movement that nearly took us to the brink of collapse if they had succeeded in taking in, in, in their plot. And like you said, this huge mass movement that had popular support. Yes. And it was and it wasn't just them. I mean, so there's also another. So the Christian friend is mostly Catholic. Father Colgan is a Catholic priest. The Klan is very, very anti-Catholic. Well, you had a Klan adjacent violent fascist plot to overthrow the U.S. government right after the 1940 election as well. You also had the Silver Shirt movement, which was kind of a middle class movement started by this guy who was this very, actually very successful Hollywood screenwriter. He'd won an O. Henry Award for his short stories like this guy who had this weird. um, He wanted to be the Adolf Hitler of the United States. People, his followers viewed him that way. He commanded that his followers had to have tens of thousands of rounds of ammunition in every home and lots of different firearms. They did. It was teachers, businessmen, very middle class thing. It was very uh, popular both in California, the Pacific Northwest. He had thousands of followers. And their plan was to take over West Coast um, armories challenge the military National Guard and law enforcement there to join their fight against the communists and the Jews and to install a Hitler-friendly dictator in the United States, basically by cobbling together a coalition of all the anti-Roosevelt forces in the country who'd be dissatisfied by Roosevelt's re-election in 1940. So like, yeah, yeah, and again, thousands of people um, involved in these things. And so it wasn't a foregone conclusion that we were going to get involved in World War II. It also wasn't a foregone conclusion to all Americans that if we did get involved in World War II, which side we would be on. Which, and we had wild. to fight for that. We had to fight for it. And we should remember that fight because um, the people who fought it, who fought the fascist groups and the violent groups, they have things to teach us about how to do this work well. Offline is brought to you by OneBladeShave.com. Do you hate shaving? Yes. Yes. We used to hate shaving, too. Now I love it. (laughs) 
razor burn, irritation, ingrown hairs. Oof, they're the worst. That is until we discovered One Blade razors. One Blade is the world's most intuitive single edge razor, and it's guaranteed to eliminate your shaving related skin issues. What's the what's the movie where like one blade rules them all? Is that Lord of the Rings kind of? One ring, yeah. Sure. Yes, thank you. Yeah, well, for the, blades. Now it's for blades. Yeah, that's it's apt. That's why these that's blades apt. rule them all. So I started using this. It's 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 really good. You look great today. Thank you very much. You and I it. and I'm always cutting myself. And I'm always cutting myself at the moment that I can least afford mm. to be bleeding because I'm about to go do something. Yeah. And then you're like putting you put little toilet paper on the on the cut no. and it's just look, it's terrible. Avoid that step with one. It blade. is. There's no other place where you're like, oh, I need to cut something. I should do it with six blades at once. <laughs> It's stupid. I can't, I've never true. thought about it before. It's really stupid. Yeah. Shaving is actually therapeutic with a one blade shave. If you if you if you don't go to therapy, you just use one blade. Uh, if you're <laughs> using a multi blade cartridge razor, it's time you learn that it's not you, it's them. Them being all those blades. <laughs> what? Well, it's just you know, uh, big ra- big. Ra- How about this, guys? We big, blades. Big razor companies have been lying to us for decades, saying that more blades Whoa. equals better shaves. It's just not true. The, the Onion tried to warn us. All those blades are tearing up your skin. One Blade's state-of-the-art, award-winning razor design makes single-edge shaving completely natural and effortless. With old-school safety razors, you're constantly trying to keep the angle right to avoid cutting yourself. One Blade razors have a patented pivoting head that hugs the skin, ensuring the blade is always at the right angle all by itself. Also, your disposable plastic cartridge razor is not recyclable. Oh, boy. This is highly problematic. Every year, literally billions of them end up in landfills and waterways. But one blade refill blades are 100% recyclable. They even send you this great little blade disposal bank with your razor handle. As soon as you fill it up and it holds like 60 blades, you just toss the whole thing into the recycling bin. So upgrade your shave, save your skin, and save the planet one blade at a time. Head over to onebladeshave.com slash offline today and use code offline to get 10% off your first order. All one blade razor handles are guaranteed for life and all orders have a 60 day return policy. So there's no risk at all in trying a brand new one blade razor today to upgrade your shave and to start shaving responsibly. Get 10% off your one blade order today at onebladeshave.com slash offline. That's O N E bladeshave.com slash offline to get 10% off your first order with code offline. Offline is brought to you by Blue Moon. With all the brewing techniques and experimental flavors, choosing a craft beer can get overwhelming. You have said we were going to have Blue Moons during this ad read like a dozen times and you've failed to deliver every single time. This is an attack on you, John Favreau. I have nothing to say in response. Why don't you get offline and get us some... Guilty as charged. Blue Moons because they're delicious. I'm going to bring in a Blue Moon. Thank you. I'm going to... Next time. It's 4.45 p.m. It's a perfect time for a Blue Moon. It's going to happen next time. I don't want you saying no when I bring it in next time. I have two of them. Okay. You don't have to be an aficionado to recognize the simply delicious taste of Moon Haze from Blue Moon. Moon Haze is an award-winning hazy pale ale that has the iconic Blue Moon citrus taste with a deliciously bold, slightly hoppy, juicy flavor. Lean into hazy pale ale brewed with dried whole oranges and crafted with refreshing tropical and slight coconut flavors. Each sip is smooth with just a little bit of bitterness. Moon Haze won gold at the 2020 Great American Beer Festival for best hazy or juicy pale ale. What do I enjoy most about Moon Haze? Everything. All of it. It tastes delicious, refreshing. It's like a little more flavor than a regular beer, mm-hmm. but it doesn't taste too heavy. That's yeah, why I like it. Great. Get Moon Haze from Blue Moon delivered by visiting get.bluemoonbeer.com slash offline to see your delivery options. That's get.bluemoonbeer.com slash offline. Celebrate responsibly. Blue Moon Brewing Company, Golden, Colorado Ale. You mentioned the acquittal. And to me, that's like a real, it, it made me sort of rethink the whole thing and, and draw more parallels to today because like y- you expect that a bunch of fascists go to trial uh, and after they've been arrested for a plot to violently overthrow the government and, you know, they're going to get convicted. But instead, you tell the story of how there's like all these sympathizers, that the, there's, there's, there's sympathy for them in the jury, right? And, and based on these two first two episodes, like the one lesson I think applies to today is like we can't just sit back and expect that our criminal justice system or even our government will protect us from fascism. Because the struggle against fascism at its core is a struggle for hearts and minds, including the hearts and minds of people within those institutions. And I think about how many people seemed like over the last several years, they were waiting for like Bob Mueller to save us. And then Mm -hmm. the first impeachment and the second impeachment and now the January 6th hearings and Merrick Garland, anything that could free us from the actual burden of having to do the hard work of persuasion. Yes. Like have you have you thought about that? <laughs> yes, exactly. Like the, the part of the reason that I'm interested in this as a topic is not because 
Father Coughlin is an an analog to somebody who's doing that kind of work today or because there's some forgotten Trump-like figure who we can analogize. It's not that. It's the timeless and recurring appeal of of fascism and authoritarianism and people being receptive to the idea that there's some other, there's some parasitic other, whether it's the Jews or the immigrants or the liberals or the gay people or whatever it is, there's some other that's taking away what is rightfully yours. They need to be exterminated and then we can go back to the way it was when we were in our rightful place as the people in charge. That message is the core message of fascism and authoritarianism and it has appeal and you have to win the argument regardless of who's the figurehead at the moment. Like, there's a reason that all the strong men around the world who are preaching on preaching these kinds of messages all kind of seem the same. Like, if you squint, can you tell Berlusconi from Orban? I don't know. They're both kind of the same. Maybe one's a little heavier. You know, but they're all this. It's all the same thing. And it's this recurring political and human impulse to turn ourselves over to strong men and to give up on democracy because democracy allows for other people to have a say, too. And that is the fight. And that fight is about exposing people who are organizing along these lines and opposing them and, you know, making sure they're brought up on trial when they do commit crimes. But first of all, not all of these things are crimes. And second of all, the kinds of crimes these are are really hard to win convictions of in a liberal democracy where you have the right to think anything you want, say anything you want and associate with whoever you want. Our constitutional protections that make us a liberal democracy also make it hard to get convictions on sedition. Even when you've got it happening, sedition happens. It's just very hard to count on the criminal justice system itself to be the silver bullet for getting rid of that. Well, especially because most sedition plots that get tried don't succeed by definition, right? By definition, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you'd be, like, you'd have us on trial if right. you had succeeded. It said it's you on so, trial. But it's yeah. a way, I mean, and we, we're seeing this, I'm sure, today with the Oath Keepers and everything that's happening around January 6th. There is a, and you, you get this from the right sometimes, like, oh, was it really serious and that scary because they didn't succeed? But it's like, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. But if they succeeded, that would be there would be no government anymore. <laughs> but they wanted to. Adam Schiff was really good on this in the second impeachment, which I think we sort of forgotten like what yeah. it was like actually in, when they tried the second impeachment. But Schiff was the one who made the point and he was like, it can't be that you can try to violently overthrow the U.S. government. And if you succeed, you get to be dictator for life. And if you fail, nothing happens. <laughs> like, that, that can't be the decision tree you are presented with as a potential fascist um, insurrectionist. And so, like, there has to be some kind of consequence. But the consequence, you know, for for our particular experience with this in January 6th, maybe some of it it's going to happen in court for the people who are the high-level conspirators. But more likely it's going to happen with what the January 6th committee is doing in exposing the truth of it, making sure there can't be revisionist history, trying to bring about political accountability for those who did it. That's that's as much the work. So the Nazis are directly involved in this plot. They they spread pop- propaganda in the U.S. Their agents actually influenced uh, U.S. politicians, supported the Christian front. And it made me think about how Putin and other authoritarians are trying to destabilize democracies like ours with similar tactics, maybe more advanced ta- tactics now that thanks to technology. How much was that on your mind when you were learning about this story? I didn't actually know about the Hitler government's direct funding and involvement in some of this stuff until pretty far into it. It was kind of like, oh, and then there and there was also that. Um, and it ends up being important because the Justice Department goes through this process Um, which you can sort of see from the outside. I'm not sure anybody's ever kind of written about it this way, but you can see that if you you put it on a timeline, you line it up chronologically in terms of what we know the Justice Department was looking at and where the FBI had informants and stuff, you can see the Justice Department realizing chronologically, okay, the Hitler government has infiltrated the U.S. Congress and is paying off U.S. senators and U.S. congressmen to spread... Nazi propaganda, actually propaganda written by the the German government in Berlin to spread that propaganda to the American people at the expense of the American taxpayers using Congress to do it. That's yes. bad. <laughs> and the Hitler government is also funding and supporting violent pro-fascist movements in the United States that are planning on attacking the U.S. government and trying to overthrow it. And those things are happening at the same time. And so you have 
if you th- each of those things is scary, but if you think about them together, that's very dangerous because then that's very violent and aggressive and also very close to real political power. So ha- being able to run a potential inside-outside strategy um, when the Hitler government is spending a lot of money and a lot of energy trying to operate this way in the United States, I think that's what flipped out the Justice Department. Not flipped them out, but sort of spurred them to action. When they put the Christian Front on trial in 1940 and failed, it was a huge humiliation for the government, and they were really unwilling to pursue any other kinds of prosecutions like that. For several years thereafter, it was only when they got to the point where both of these things were happening at once. And frankly, munitions plants started blowing up in the United States and there started to be what appeared to be acts of Nazi sabotage here that they realized, okay, we got to go. And the prosecution that they brought in 1944, kind of, again, alleging a conspiracy where the the Germans were doing it um, and, and Americans were carrying out those wishes, it was a totally unwieldy prosecution. And we'll get there later in the podcast to yeah. explain how that bared out. But that nexus was what was scary to them. And I, I think... That's, you know, Russia being interested in shaping U.S. politics and shaping American public opinion is something that I don't think we need to be hair on fire about all the time. It's been going on for a long time. The reason it was sort of it, it's the way it becomes a, a more hair on fire moment in the United States is when those interests get close to real power um, and when they get close to those who are willing to use violence. And so that, I think, is what Putin's intervention in U.S. politics, th- those are the sort of tripwires to watch for. And that's why somebody getting into the White House who welcomes Russian intervention in the election to get him there is a is a scary thing and is worth flipping out about. Well, you know, you mentioned that there's, 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 uh, there's no one analogous to Father Coughlin today in terms of both extremism and reach. But, you know, one thing we talk about on this show all the time is how the Internet and social media has supercharged the spread of propaganda and disinformation. And that's especially true on the right. How do you think that's changed the threat that we're facing today and also how we face it? That's a really good question. I mean, on the one hand, talking about nobody having Coglin's reach is kind of comforting in terms of no one person being able to do that much damage. On the other hand, how much more damaging is it when you don't have a Coglin to sort of monitor and respond to and instead it's coming from everywhere? Yeah. It's just, I mean, the, the iterative nature of social media where you feed something back to it and then it accelerates what gets fed back to you in terms of, accelerates it in terms of its extremism. That's something that really there wasn't, there, there, there isn't a, a historical analogy for. Part of Hitler's rise to power, right, what happens to him between 1923 and the Beer Hall Putsch in, in 1933 when he's chancellor, part of what happens is that he sort of perfects his idea of propaganda. Um, OK, I can't just take power by with a violent cadre in order to take power and hold power and rule the country. I need to move people and manipulate them by propaganda, which we need to do as the first priority of our our um of, of our governing strategy. And the United States never took that as seriously as the Germans did. We saw it as like kind of malign disinformation or bad advertising or something, something that might be annoying to Americans or might be somehow, you know, giving us bad ideas. But the, they appreciated the pure power of it, which is why they spent tens of millions of dollars in 1930s money attacking us that way. Mm. So, I mean, I, I do feel like there's... That tech, when technology changes, things can get more toxic. Um, but our strategies to interfere with it can also just get more sophisticated. Yeah. So, you know, it's it's, it's well, it's decentralized it's a in a way also. And you don't like you said, it's harder to monitor like the effects of the spread of information because people are going down YouTube rabbit holes and they're on Reddit and then they're on like 8chan and for, and and this stuff bubbles up. I go back and forth where like, it was it better to have Trump on Twitter where we're all watching him all the time and can see it? Or is it is it worse? Is it better to have him on Truth Social with a bunch of other uh, right wing extremists who are just like causing all kinds of trouble that's not getting bubbled up to the surface all the time because we're not monitoring it? And I, I haven't been able to figure out which is worse, but it's really hard to sort of wrap our arms around all the different threads of extremism that's out there. And I think that's partly because of um, because of technology and the Internet. But it also affects him, I think, because um, 
one of the things that happens in his truth, truth social bubble is that he's only speaking to people who agree with him and who are going to egg him on rather than people who are going to be outraged by him. And so what he thinks is resonating, what he thinks is working, what he thinks people like to hear from him yeah. is, is, is from a more narrow sort of corner. And it means that when his message does cross over to a broader audience, it sounds crazier than it might otherwise that have is, done had yeah. he been able to work it out on a more broad-based platform like Twitter. And so it makes him, I think it actually does push him into more extreme positions. And that is dangerous to the extent that he still holds sway over the Republican Party. But to the extent that people who aren't necessarily politically engaged are sort of checking in with what he's saying these days, he does sound more bananas now than he did a year ago. And that was true of the 2020 campaign, even versus the 2016 campaign, is he was talking about things in the stump in 2020 that you had to be so online to Mm -hmm. understand even what he was talking about. And that's happening again today, too. It is it is stump speeches. And so does I mean, do you want him out there like spreading 8chan memes and like putting out, you know, stuff about QAnon that nobody doesn't resonate with anybody? I don't know. I mean, I don't know how much the danger of Trump right now is that he appeals to disengaged people non-political people who may or may not vote. Is that the danger of Trump right now? Or is the danger of Trump right now that he is speaking to true believers who may commit extremist active acts of violence or other forms of attacks on the country that are coming from the real fringe? I don't know. Yeah. No, I think I, I think the latter is quite dangerous. Um, yeah. What did you learn from this story about what draws people to fascism? Um, because that does seem like a more timeless lesson um, between, you know, the, the period that you covered and what's happening right now? I don't know if I know what draws people to it, but I know that you don't have to be very good at it to sort mm. of strum that chord. Like you don't actually have to be a genius or a maestro or an excellent communicator. You just have to be good enough at pushing those buttons. I mean, we're wired as humans as the type of in the in the type of society that we live in to pick an other to problematize it to dehumanize it and decide that's the root of our problems and decide that we want to go back to some mythical thing where that problem hadn't overtaken us and 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 ruined our ruined our otherwise good lives we are just wired for that and um the thing that strikes me over and over again with the Christian front plot and the silver shirts plot and the clan adjacent plot and all these other things that I go through in, in the podcast between 19 sort of 1940, late 1939 and 1944, is that they did get dismissed by people. All these guys got dismissed as crackpots or as being non-compelling or as being, you know, kooky in, in some sort of way. So these things must not have resonated with normal people. And it turns out that being clownish um, or being ham-handed in some way doesn't map neatly onto being ineffective when what you're playing with is this kind of psychological and sociological fire. Um, and so, yeah, it's just dangerous. You know? No, and it's also I'm, – I'm so glad that you said that it's, it's easy and, and it, you don't have to be that smart because I do think one thing – Democrats do today is they look at Republicans and say, oh, they're so smart. They always figure it out. Why can't we be that smart? And it's like mm-hmm. what they're what what at least the extreme right is trying to do. That's easier. Right. It's easier to burn down the barn. It is easier, actually, to resort to hate and violence. There, there's mm-hmm. nothing like magical about that. Liberal democracy is really hard. Yes. <laughs> persuading <laughs> uh, persuading a, a country of 300 plus million people that is incredibly diverse that we all got to hang together and follow laws and let each other say things that we hate. <laughs> um, that's really hard. And I don't think we get that like our side just has a much tougher challenge ahead of us. Yes. And also, given that we're a liberal democracy, like some people, I think some people look at this kind of content in this podcast and the stuff that we're talking about here and think, God, that is a drag. Why are you working on that? Like, don't yeah. you need a break from this stuff? To me, this is heartening because the lesson of this to me is, hey, sedition happens. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> like, sedition happens. You know, fascist uprisings happen. Like, we're yeah. a country that has more guns than people. And so when we have people who have been preached to that violence is the answer and politics must be abandoned and instead they need to take power by force, they're going to have access to a lot of force to do it. That's going to happen. That's part of the mix. And it doesn't mean that things are working well, but it does mean that 
life proceeds apace and we ought to learn from history. And the Americans who have faced these things before ought to be studied and ought to be remembered. And we ought to know their stories because this stuff does recur. It's yeah. it's human nature and it is a feature of an open society where you have the right to think, say, and associate the way you please. And we just have to be good at fighting it. We need to expect that it's going to keep happening. We need to inoculate ourselves so that we're not shocked when it happens. People need to know when they start hearing anti-Semitic tropes or you know, blame the immigrant kind of tropes, that that's old news, that this is something that we've been, you know, that that demagogues the, 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 the world over have been pushing over and over again. And they ought to be laughed at when they say it. But we ought to expect that they'll keep saying it. And we just need to get we need better muscles and we need to be, I think, more connected to our history of hiding, fighting it in the past to know that we're not alone and we're not doing this for the first time. Offline is brought to you by Hold On Bags. Plastic. It's everywhere we look and not enough is being done about it. A hundred billion plastic bags are used and then thrown away every year. That plastic bag you see in the gutter or floating in a stream or washed up on the beach, multiply that by a hundred billion. It's not great. This is the opposite of the speech uh, delivered in The Graduate. (laughs) But there's a better way and it can start with a better bag. Hold On is a company born from the idea that there must be a better way to go about our daily chores. Trash bags and kitchen bags are necessary staples, but do they need to be 100% plastic? No. Nope. Hold on, trash and kitchen bags are heavy-duty, plant-based, non-toxic, and 100% home compostable, which mean they break down in weeks, not decades, without filling up our landfills or polluting our oceans. Hold on wants to be part of the growing movement away from single-use plastic, which, if you ask most experts, is the single worst kind of plastic. At every stage, production, disposal, and decomposition, plastic bags are doing harm to our earth, our water, and even our bodies. Hold On Bags are on a mission to make daily chores something you can feel good about one bag at a time. You know, remember when DC banned a lot of single-use bags started taxing them? Mm-hmm. It was so effective. It worked. I kinda ra- I'm kind of radicalized on this issue. It is nuts that we just hand out plastic constantly, and it's all just sitting in the middle of the Pacific, swirling around for eternity. It's just ridiculous, too, because you can bring in, like, a, a cloth yeah, bag. It's not that hard. Like, you can use Hold On, right? To shop plant-based bags and replace single-use plastics all over your home, visit holdonbags.com slash offline or enter offline at checkout to save 20% off your order. Sustainability has never been more simple. That's H-O-L-D-O-N bags.com slash offline or enter offline to receive 20% off your order. Small things can lead to lasting change if we stop and say, hold on. (laughs) Wow. What nice. delivery? Thank you. Thank you. Give that man an Emmy. It's like I just got it. It's like I just Emmy. got Can the you whole guys, point. Uh, you know? For those on. listening at home, I hope that the sound of a tear falling on the microphone <laughs> didn't didn't distract you. <laughs> Thank you, Hold On, for sponsoring this episode. Offline is brought to you by Smile Actives. Are you self-conscious about your smile due to stains or your teeth aging you? Popular food and drinks are known to stain teeth. Beverages like coffee and wine stain them over time. So what can you do to brighten your smile? Well... You should give Smile Actives a try. Smile Actives is safe, effective, easy to use, and will keep you smiling proudly. Emily whitened her teeth a couple of weeks ago, and she was in pain for 48 hours because she went to the dentist office, and I told her, don't go to the dentist. That's going to hurt. Use Smile Actives. Yep. And now she's sold. And I've been using Smile Actives, and I Nothing love it. Nothing makes easy. a marriage go like saying I told you so. <laughs> wow, Smile Actives. Put that on one of those fucking live, laugh, love things. <laughs> Be part of your... Honey, sell that, anyway, sell that at a Marshalls. So. Honestly, she told me, she said, please use my story. Tell my story. Tell my story. Aunt. Tell people I love to tell laugh my story when, gone. <laughs> when we talk to when we talk about when you do Smile Actives on the pod. Smile Actives makes a teeth whitening gel that can simply be added to your toothpaste every time you brush your teeth. So no change in your routine, no extra time, yet people will start commenting on your whiter, brighter smile in just days. Simply add Smile Actives Pro Whitening Gel to your regular toothpaste. It's been formulated with polyclean technology to boost stain removal and deliver active whitening ingredients into teeth, grooves, and crannies to get better whitening. Smile Actives is the whitening boost your favorite toothpaste needs to give you the smile you deserve. 97% of Smile Actives users in a clinical trial reported up to six shades whiter on average, all within 30 days. Visit smileactives.com slash offline today to receive our special buy one, get one free offer. We got a BOGO. BOGO. And free shipping and handling. We got a BOGO right here in Smile Actives. That's smileactives.com slash offline. Well, without giving away the rest of the series, like, what strategies were broadly effective in fighting fascism um, in, in the period that you're talking about in the early 40s? Exposure is the most important thing, actually, mm. I think. I mean, I think that's the lesson. And I don't know that that's true time immemorial. That's cert- that certainly seems to be the lesson of this chunk of time, sort of 1940 to 1944, that I'm looking at. Um, you get 
um, very popular, very influential journalists and columnists, people like Drew Pearson and Walter Winchell and uh, Dorothy Thompson, deciding that they can sort of train their fire in this direction. And that defines this as a problem and as a specific type of thing bubbling up in the country to be aware of for, you know, tens of millions of Americans who are reading those very influential journalists. That that really helps. You also get individual activists, very brave activists. Um, there's a woman in, named Frances Sweeney in Boston who's a, herself a devout Catholic young woman um, who's horrified by what's going on with this Coughlin-adjacent Christian front and what's happening with basically radicalizing Irish Catholics in Boston. And she takes it upon herself to infiltrate those groups, to heckle them, to make sure that they know there's opposition. And then she basically berates the local police department until they agree to start monitoring them and ultimately to raid them when they get involved in overt Nazi propaganda stuff. In the same time in in Southern California, the Jewish community there is absolutely horrified by the fact that there is an Aryan bookstore. It's called the Aryan Bookstore. Oh, my God. Operating adjacent to something called Deutsche House in, in Los Angeles. And there's brown shirt meetings happening in Los Angeles. And there's there's a not, there's a Hitler Youth summer camp in La Crescenta, California. Like, it's happening. And the Jewish community is scared. There's violence against Jews that's happening in Southern California. These groups are getting stronger. They're openly recruiting. The police and the sheriff's department want nothing to do with it. The FBI is no help. And they, like decide, okay, we're going to form our own private spy groups where we persuade people who we know who look German to go infiltrate these groups and report on them and expose them. And eventually, essentially, they become like an Antifa spy organization to expose what these groups are doing. They serve sort of as agent provocateur in some cases, and they, again, force law enforcement and in some interesting cases, military intelligence um, to respond to what these groups are doing. So it's all it is intrepid and it's brave and it's interesting. And in some cases, it's very funny, but it's all about exposure. It's about not allowing the op- them to operate only in their own bubble and to define what they're doing in their own terms, but rather to shine a light on them and to trust that Americans will recognize the fascist message as being problematic as much as it appeals to some of their some of their base. What um what do you think the pro democracy forces in this country need to be doing now that we're not currently doing or maybe not doing well enough? Well, I think you had it right when you were talking about the obligation to persuade, right? Yeah. There's it's you can't content moderate your way out of this problem in social media, right? You can't say, like, the problem is the person who created this meme. Well, the person who created this meme created it and sent it somewhere, seeded it somewhere. But then the reason it became a problem that you know about is because it was widely circulated by people for whom it resonated. That, that is a persuasion problem. And it's an kind of an education problem in the sense of that people should hopefully, I think sort of take on the mantle of education around this issue. I know that sounds wussy, but like people ought to know that the anti-Semitic stuff that's circulating right now around Trump's social media presence and pro, pro-Trump social media presence is not like edgy, modern, um, you know, anti-woke right. uh, bravery. It's old news. Like, are you seriously trafficking in this old stuff? You know who you sound like? That kind of um, inoculation, I think, to people so that they don't, um, just get moved by this stuff uncritically is the work of public intellectuals and journalists and activists and people who have sway in in the media landscape where uh, people are otherwise being confronted with these kinds of messages. Yeah. So I, I, I um, this, the other podcast I do called The Wilderness, I, I sat down with focus groups of, of voters who aren't very connected to politics, but they were all Biden voters. They showed up in 2020, but they're not sure if they're going to show up again. And you know, uh, everyone on Twitter who listens to these focus groups is like, I listened to a couple episodes. I can't do it anymore. If these people don't know by now that, that we're under a fascist threat or, or that the Republicans are extreme, or if they don't know this by now, then I can't help them. I give up. And I'm just like, I, it, you know, on one hand, I'm like, I totally get the frustration. I sat in those focus groups. I had to have a poker face when people said, like, what's a midterm? You know, like, I, I, yeah. I, 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 I get it. But... I'm not trying to be like naive here 
What I'm trying to say is this is the only way. <laughs> if we want a liberal democracy, we're stuck here with the other 300 some million people. We have to persuade them. It's the only way because the only other option is violence. Yes. Yes. And and here I brought I brought this. I know that I know we're on audio, but I'll show you. Can you see this? Oh yeah, so this Christian is, Front. So this is an anti-Christian Front pamphlet that was put out by an anti-fascist organization uh, in the Bronx. Um, in the late 30s, trying to get people in the Bronx to mobilize against the Christian front thugs that were holding street meetings and like randomly beating up Jews on the streets of the Bronx. Practical steps. It can be stopped now before it acquires the prestige of success. (laughs) Here are things that you can do. First of all, keep us, meaning keep your local anti-fascist organization, advised of incidents such as stabbings and beatings that may happen in your neighborhood. (laughs) Number two, petition your local city council and police to take action within the existing law and without violating the right of free speech against the incitements to riot from the Christian front. Number three, organize local tolerance committees in your own neighborhood to hold street and other meetings. Number four, ask your local clergyman to preach sermons on tolerance. Distribute literature exposing the Christian front for what it really is. Like this is, you know, in the 30s, people trying to deal with the threat of a group that at that very moment was stockpiling bombs and heavy machine guns to go simultaneously assassinate a dozen congressmen and set off a national civil war to install a fascist dictator. And the way they're doing it is like, can you form a tolerance committee on your block in the Bronx? <laughs> well, I mean, it, this is this yes. is the struggle that we all have right now is like I, I wake up every day and before we do the pot, it's like, all right, I, I think that the danger out there is real and extreme. But I also don't want to completely freak people out and sound hysterical all the time. Right. Like yes. and it's and, the, and social media makes this easy too, right. Like everything's at an 11 all the time. And yep. if everything's at 11 all the time, then like people start tuning you out. But at the same time, you don't want to be completely calm because you're like, hey, uh, there's there's a potential for a fascist takeover out there. <laughs> And so learning about what a fascist take that a fascist takeover is something that's a live option for some people who are doing some of this work. People who are like, that's yeah. a good thing to know. Like, this yeah. isn't so extreme that it's impossible. There was actually a violent armed attack on the U.S. Capitol within the last two years. We should get real about that and not have revisionist history about it. Yeah. But also the solution to it is to give people who might be attracted to those ideas contact with other ideas. Yeah. There has to be human to human contact. There has to be door knocking. There has mm-hmm. to be civic organizations that aren't designed to polarize, but are instead designed to bring people together. And there has to be a way for people to whistleblow if they start getting into or getting adjacent to some of this violent stuff that they then have doubts about. There has to be a way for them to truth tell about it, whistleblow about it, and a place for them to go. And so part of it, yes, is law enforcement, but there has to be civic strength. You know, people who are part of professional organizations, people who are part of religious organizations, people who are part of civic groups that, again, aren't designed to polarize, that aren't designed to set you against somebody else, but rather to get you talking to each other. All that stuff builds us as a liberal democracy. And it sounds boring, but it's the work. And it never stops. It never Never stops. stops. That's what it means to be a citizen in a free country. That is 100 percent correct. Um, you're one of the most brilliant and influential progressive journalists and storytellers of our time. Like, how do you see your role in this fight going forward? I know you're pursuing other projects. You're not doing five nights a week now on cable. Um, what's what's your sort of thought about how you're how you're in this fight? I don't know. I mean, I I've got. I feel like I'm like really. I, I was saying to somebody the other day, like. The story that's in this podcast is something that I feel like I've been 20 months pregnant with. <laughs> like, yeah. I have to get this story out there. But it's also hard to do well. Like, this is, you know, yeah. the, the, this is something that I am have been working on for months and months and months and will be working on until the last second before the last episode is posted in November. With Each episode, new episode comes out every Monday for the next six weeks. Um And so I'm just, I'm going to keep doing that. I've got some other projects that are kind of along these lines in terms of, I mean, for me, what speaks to me is history. And so I think that there are things in America's relatively recent past that help me contextualize and understand and sort of make me energized about the work that's to be done now. So I'm going to keep doing that. I like to have I'm I'm really enjoying having a little more space, not having to be on the air every night so that I can work on longer term projects like this. So I've got like kind of 
seven or eight different things along these lines. The podcast is the first one. But then, you know, I'm I'm every night, every Monday night on MSNBC and I'm I'm leading our coverage of all the January 6th hearings. We think the last one is going to be yeah. um, this week. Um, and, you know, I'll be there on election night. And I don't know. I just feel like there's a lot of stories to tell. I want a little more elbow room to be able to read more and not get my, you know, I don't want to be online every day. I don't want to be That's... in the news cycle every day. I want to be finding primary source stuff from the 40s that helps me tell stories that hopefully illuminate where we are. I don't well, know, I'm just trying to stay alive. <laughs> we are we we are all extremely fortunate that you have decided to uh, get offline a little bit more and tell these stories. It is a fantastic podcast. Uh, everyone go listen to Ultra. Uh, comes out every Monday. And uh, Rachel Maddow, thank you so much for joining offline. John, thank you so much. This was really fun. And I'm glad, so glad you're doing the show. You're, you guys are doing fantastic work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.